Do you know what buttermilk, yogurt, creme fraiche, and sour cream have in common? They're all cultured dairy products that can be used to magically enhance your baking. Here to explain is farmer and cultured dairy producer, Paul Lusinski. Then I'm going to bake two delicious recipes, a plum and creme fraiche pie, and a pistachio rhubarb yogurt cake. Plus my longtime friend and cookbook author, Sarah Foster is here with her buttermilk cardamom pie, all using cultured dairy products. All today on Martha Bakes. From buttermilk to creme fraiche, cultured dairy products are something that I have always loved. Today, I've invited Paul Lusinski, dairy farmer and fellow enthusiast, to share his insight on the potential for cultured dairy products in the kitchen. It's very nice to have you here, Paul. Well, very excited for coming. to be here, Martha. So what led you to be a dairy farmer, one of the, I think, most difficult professions? Yeah, it's good to have a challenge, right? Yeah. Um, well, back at that time, my wife and I had a vegetable farm, which she had started, and we were producing most of our own food, except for the fact that I consider a quart of yogurt a single serving. And um, we sort of couldn't keep up with the yogurt budget. So we said, hey, we might as well get a cow. Right. And if you have one cow, why not have 40? And so what cultured products do you produce at the present time? Yeah, primarily we make yogurt. And then we also make sour cream because a low-fat yogurt yields this beautiful cream, right? Yes, of course. And you got to do something with yeah. it. Yeah. So how do you make your yogurt? Uh, what we do is, of course, the milk comes out of the cows, uh, one room over from where the yogurt is made. We heat it up to pasteurization temperature, cool it back down in a vat, add the culture, and pump it over to our filling machine. And then the containers go on rolling racks into the warm room, the incubation room. Mm -hmm. That's really where it turns from milk in the yogurt. And then at the right time, which is actually based on pH, uh, the cultures acidify the milk which is what leads to the firmness. We roll it into the cooler. And is that your plain yogurt? That one is our whole milk plain yogurt, yes. Mm. See, that's what I buy, if I can find it. Ah, yeah. Just whole milk plain yogurt. So this is pretty thin. Well, it's been stirred up because the cream, it's not homogenized, the cream rises to the surface. I see. Um, and so to put it in the bowl, it's stirred up. Mm, yummy. Uh, oh, good. And then you flavor some. Yes, we have a maple, which is also whole milk. And this yogurt is? And that one is vanilla, which is also sweetened with maple syrup exclusively, just a lighter grade, um, and then organic vanilla mm, extract. Very good, too. Yeah. Very good yogurt. So what about buttermilk? Buttermilk is interesting because buttermilk nowadays, when it says cultured buttermilk, you see it on the package, it is milk, could be whole milk, could be low-fat milk, that has a culture put into it, similar to yogurt culture, but different species, to thicken it. Historically, what buttermilk is, the reason why it has the word butter in it, is it's the liquid left over from making butter. From that churning way, the butter. From churning the butter. And in those wooden butter churns, the culture would live in there and would then culture the buttermilk. What about your delicious sour cream, which does not look like any sour cream yeah, I ever get? Yeah, you know, get. it's about 40% butter fat, like heavy cream, basically. So it's very fattening. Oh, absolutely. Yep, no question about it. That's just why <laughs> That's it's so good. so right? tasty. Traditionally, sour cream we think of as having like a 12 to maybe 20% fat content, whereas creme fraiche is more up in the 40 to 50 range. Oh, is it? Yeah. This so tastes... really, we should be calling it creme fraiche. Yes, this you is know. amazing. Yeah. And I love the color of it. And oh, what kind of cows do you have? I forgot to ask. Yeah, so we have two kinds of cows, jerseys, the little mm -hmm. brown-eyed cows that are quite well known, um, which are known for their high butter fat and high protein, which is what we need for the yogurt and also Normandies, which are a French breed that have similar components and are also really good grazers. Normandies actually are, obviously they're from Normandy, and any camembert that you get from France is made with Normandy right. milk. How many gallons from a Jersey cow a day? Yeah, so our cows, they average about 40 pounds, which is just under five gallons. That probably, that the makes Normandy sound like cows a lot. too? Yeah, the Normandies and Jerseys are pretty equivalent. That's actually not a lot of milk by commercial no. standards. Yeah, we are. Holstein. Holsteins are like over 100 pounds, so yeah. twice as much. We are much more focused on components, on protein, which is what we need for firm yogurt without stabilizers, and the butter fat kind of comes as a benefit right. along with that. Right. It also has to do with the fact our cows are outside grazing. All we year? Don't feed it. Well, as long as we can get them yeah. from the early in May. And frequently we make it into November. Well, I have really good grass. If you have a couple extra cows. Send a couple down there. Just send them on down. <laughs> Sounds and they'll, good. they'll be so happy. It'll be their summer vacation. <laughs> I'd love to have a couple. 
Be careful because from a couple you can get to 40 pretty quick. It just happens. <laughs> Now, do those little yogurt makers really work? If we got, if I got a quart of your beautiful milk, yes. can I make my own yogurt? I could, yes. Yeah. And in fact, when we were doing our R&D in the kitchen, before we ever started making yogurt commercially, I bought one of those, put a controllable thermostat on it so we could try different cultures at mm -hmm. different temperatures. And that was really how we figured out exactly how to get our process dialed in. Well, it's really nice to hear about your passion and your enthusiasm for small dairy farming. It's an admirable profession. Oh, well, thank you. And thank you. And we benefit from it. All right. Thank Sounds you. good. For rich texture and tangy flavor, I'm using creme fraiche in my streusel topped plum pie. As it cooks, the creme fraiche in the filling balances out the sugar in the plums and turns custard-like for a really memorable dessert. Um, we're starting first with the crust. You need one and a quarter cups of all-purpose flour, quarter teaspoon of salt, two tablespoons of sugar, and let's just process that a little bit and mix it up. I'm doing it right in the food processor because it just does it so quickly. The butter, icy cold, one stick, quarter of a pound, unsalted, creamery butter, and one egg yolk. And you can just pulse this. You don't want to overwork it because you want those pieces of butter to still be visible. And basically, two tablespoons of very cold ice water while you're pulsing. That should do it. See, it doesn't take any time at all to make a crust. And this squeeze out that holds together very nicely. So this should be wrapped in a flat disc and chilled at least an hour. So there are three parts to this delicious pie. The crust, of course, which we've just made. Now the streusel topping and then the filling. In a medium bowl, whisk together one cup of all-purpose flour, three quarters of a cup of confectioner sugar, baking powder, three quarters of a teaspoon, and some salt, quarter of a teaspoon. And into this, cut your butter, one and a half sticks of cold, unsalted butter, cut into quarter-inch cubes. And I find that if you cut the butter while it's really, really cold, you'll be able to get these nice cubes, which makes it much easier to cut. You want it rough. I'm using a pastry cutter, which is the same thing in my family as an egg salad cutter. We cut the hard-boiled eggs with this. And you just want to set this aside until you fill your pie. And now to roll out our dough. So here is our chilled dough. This can be fitted right into a 9 and a half or 10-inch pie plate. You can fold it like this. If it's sturdy enough, you can roll it on your rolling pin to unroll it into the dish. And then with your fingers, press it down into the dish and just cut it evenly all the way around. I like an overhang, but I'm just cutting it off where it hits the counter. So your crust will be pretty even all the way around. I'm looking forward to making pies like this for Thanksgiving. And I make a lot of pies because I like to give everybody who works on my farm a pie to take home. So then I fold this underneath, makes a nice little raised edge which then can be fluted. And there are many ways to flute an edge. You can use two fingers and a third finger and go like this. It makes a nice scallop. You can use a fork like this, and you can flute some more. This is not going to match our swap out, but I'm just showing you different ways to do it. And don't forget to dock the bottom with your fork. Just a few of these will help prevent the bottom from erupting while it's baking. So you can just put this in the freezer for 30 minutes or in your refrigerator for an hour or so. Now we have a pie crust that's already docked, already fluted. That's a beautiful one. Now you can fold your paper like this or you can crumple it, whichever way you feel comfortable, and pour in your well-used beans. The beans this is just a combination of beans I've been using for years and years to act as pie weights. And this goes right into a 400 degree oven for 20 minutes. After 20 minutes, lift out the parchment paper with the weights and bake an additional 12 to 16 minutes until golden brown. The crust has come out of the oven. Look how beautiful it looks. 
Now for the filling. You need one and a half pounds of plums, a pinch of salt. We're gonna macerate the fruit first for just about 15 minutes. Two tablespoons of sugar. The sugar will start the plums to soften. And this is called maceration. The plums have all been pitted and quartered. We have some here that have already macerated. And we have our streusel topping here. And we have five tablespoons of creme fraiche. Two tablespoons go in the bottom of the crust. And just spread this to pretty much cover the crust. This will help keep the crust from getting soggy. So that's that. And now a third of this streusel topping gets sprinkled right here. This is an unusual construction, but an utterly delicious one. And now all of your plums fitted right into the crust. The rest of the creme fraiche can now be dotted on top of the plums. Doesn't matter where it goes, just as long as it's evenly spread. Now the rest of your streusel. Now this goes into your 375 degree oven and it will bake for 50 minutes until the creme fraiche and juices of the plums are bubbling and the streusel is a golden brown. If the crust is getting too brown around the edges, you can just cover the whole pie with a nice little collar like this. Uh, you can just make that out of a double layer of aluminum foil. So now let the pie cool when it comes out of the oven. Now it looks like a different pie. That's because the plums have really collapsed. When you need a dessert that airs on the side of less sweet, particularly for a grown-up dinner party, this pie is the perfect pie. Enjoy it. The key to the rich flavor and moist texture of this pistachio rhubarb cake is the addition of whole milk yogurt. But what really catches your eye is the pop of color on top of the cake, thanks to roasted rhubarb. Let me show you how to roast the rhubarb. Mix one pound of rhubarb, cut into three inch pieces with a little bit of salt, a quarter of a teaspoon, a half a cup of sugar, and some butter. A tablespoon of butter just cut into little pieces and just mix that together. We're gonna to bake this in the oven until it's soft and tender and the juices have run. And so we, we can do that right on a piece of parchment. It will bake with the sugar. Just make sure it gets on the parchment. Spread it in a single layer. Get that right into a 400 degree oven for about 15 minutes. And you can move it around a little bit after a few minutes. This is what it looks like when it comes out of the oven. So to start, we must grind our pistachios and I'm using a half a cup of fresh pistachio nuts. Out of the shell, of course. So grind those up. It adds a texture to the cake and a very nice flavor. We're almost making a pistachio flour out of these pistachios. We don't want pistachio butter, we want sort of pulverized pistachios. That looks good. Now to this, add the rest of your dry ingredients. One and a half cups of all-purpose flour. Two teaspoons of baking powder. Some salt. One and a half teaspoons. And you can just process this a little bit with the nuts. And that's it. And now to make the batter, cream one stick of unsalted butter and beat until nice and light and fluffy with one cup of sugar. And add two eggs, one at a time. And one and a quarter teaspoons of vanilla. When everything is well incorporated, you can start adding your dry ingredients alternately with one cup of whole milk yogurt. Good whole milk yogurt is really thick, really tasty. It adds a tanginess to your batter and a lovely moist quality to your batter. If you can't find that yogurt, you can substitute buttermilk or milk that has been 
spiked with just a little bit of lemon juice or even cider vinegar. So this looks very nice. Put the cake batter right into a buttered, floured cake pan. And there is a round of parchment paper that's also buttered and floured in the bottom. This is an eight inch by two inch cake pan. So there is a real texture in here because of the pistachios. It's a unique flavor and color, so you'll know what they are. And it's fun to use all these different dairy products in your baking. It really does change the taste and the nutritional value of your baked goods to incorporate fresh buttermilk, the fresh yogurt, creme fraiche, sour cream could be added to that list. Get your batter nice and flat. Now one last step before you pop this into your preheated oven, and your oven should be preheated to 325 degrees. Now remember, what you're gonna see is the top of your cake. So we're gonna use half of this baked rhubarb randomly placed on top of the batter. And the rest of this rhubarb we're going to use with whipped cream for serving the cake. Now for a little added sweetness, sprinkle the cake with two tablespoons of sugar. And this goes into your 325 degree oven, 75 minutes, or until a tester comes out clean. But set your timer for 65 minutes and start checking. So this is what our cake looks like when it comes out of the pan. Let it cool in the pan for at least 15 minutes. Run a knife around the edge of the pan and then invert the cake onto a cutting board. Then re-invert it onto a wire rack and let the cake cool completely. You can serve this cake with lightly sweetened whipped cream, with the remaining rhubarb, with ice cream. Whichever way you choose to serve it, this rich cake is definitely a keeper. Try it, you'll love it. I am so happy to have my longtime friend and cookbook author, Sarah Foster here to share her recipe for buttermilk cardamom pie. Yes. So you're making a simple crust. Yeah, it's three cups of all purpose flour. We're gonna add a little bit of salt, about a quarter teaspoon and three tablespoons of sugar. Okay. And we're just gonna mix that up and a half a cup plus three tablespoons of vegetable shortening and the same amount of butter. Cold? Yes, okay. ice cold. You wanna keep everything as cold as possible. So I like to use butter and shortening because I love the flavor of the butter and the shortening gives the crust a nice crispy texture. So Martha, will you mix third a cup of water to start, ice oh, water, okay. and we might need more water than that, but we're gonna okay. start with a third of a cup and a tablespoon of vinegar. This is the Southern Touch, the vinegar. The vinegar, yeah. Tablespoon the vinegar of is vinegar. the secret. Yeah, well, why? What does it do? Because I tried it and I, I don't notice so much of a difference, but there must well, be. Well, I think it gives it a, not only a little bit of tartness, but it also helps it with that extra crispy part. So at this point, if you want to pour that around the edges while I mix it, when you're adding your liquid, you want to just add it in different places. And I just kind of work it in with a fork to begin with, because I feel that's you can mix it in better that way. Good. And you can see now it's mm. starting to clump together. And then let's take a piece of plastic wrap. And then you just want to form it into like a flat round disc because it makes it easier to roll. It makes two crust. And you wanna refrigerate this. So now Sarah has a nicely chilled disc of dough. And so you're rolling it on uh, plastic wrap. Yes, it's easier to, to lift. turn and easier to lift. And you have a nine inch glass. Do you like um, baking in glass? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I, I do like too. it because you can see the bottom and you can see that it's the consistency you want when you're par baking it. So I like to par bake my crust a little bit um, so that it keeps it, it prevents it from getting soggy. So you can see how easy with the plastic wrap. Oh, yeah. You want to do it kind of between an eighth and a quarter of an inch. And then we're going to get it in our pie pan. And you can see it's pretty sturdy. You can move it around too. And then... Here's your scissors. We're going to just trim. Over here I have a little excess. 
And then you want to just turn the edges under, your uneven edges. And there's so many different ways you can decorate. I mean, you... What are your favorite crimps? Well, I like to use the fork. You know, it's kind of that old-fashioned look where you just mash it down. But My mom always used a fork. <laughs> but you can also just crimp it. That's a really pretty way to do it. I mean, this is just yeah. kind of a great old-fashioned. Mm -hmm. And then you want to just dock all around the center of the pie that right. way. Now, do you chill it before you bake it? Uh-huh. Oh, good. Okay. And then it's got to go right back in the refrigerator for about 30 minutes. Okay. So now we're going to blind bake Sarah's crust. And the oven at this point should be preheated to 375, right? Right. So you just usually just fit that in? I usually just press this in and pour my beans oh, in. Oh, and then beans nooks too. and crannies there. Perfect. So that's good. The beans just weight down the crust so that they don't get eruptions, bubbles in them, right? Yeah, and it's okay. gonna go right in the hot oven. I like to put it in the lower third of the oven and we're gonna cook it about 10 minutes. We're gonna take the weights off and then cook it a few minutes more. Great. So here is the beautiful crust. Oh, Tell what nice made it shiny? So I put a little egg white on it right after it's baked. That keeps the filling from making the bottom soggy. So we're gonna start with a cup and a half of sugar and we're melting a stick of butter. You want to add the seeds oh, the vanilla to bean. that? Yeah, mm -hmm. So I, me I melted one stick of butter, yep. quarter of a pound, and add your vanilla bean seeds. Yeah, you want to add your seeds because you want that to kind of infuse in your butter. And so we have three tablespoons of flour. You want to just add a little bit of salt, about a quarter of a teaspoon, and a half teaspoon of cardamom. I love the flavor of cardamom and about the same amount of freshly grated nutmeg. So you could actually put the whole vanilla, after yeah, you scrape you could it, put, the whole thing put it in there, because you're not going to use that, the bean. But. And then you just want to mix this up really well before you add your liquids. Now we're going to add the butter. So just hold. Yeah, just pour it in. We're going to mix it up. A little bit of that vanilla bean in there, but that'll mm. be good. Oh, it tastes good. And now we're going to add the eggs one at a time. Mix those really well. Those eggs are beautiful. Are they from your farm? Absolutely. So that's four eggs. And then we're going to add about a cup and a quarter of this creamy buttermilk. So this is a very good tip, too. Sarah suggests that you keep your pie crust on a baking sheet so it's much easier to carry, especially once it's filled with the custard. Yeah, and it's easier to get it in and out of the oven. You don't um, mess up the edges of your pie that way. Mm. And this is going to go into a 350 degree oven for about 50 or 60 minutes. You want to put it in the center of the oven, and I usually rotate it about halfway through. Okay, well this is what the moment I have been <laughs> waiting for. So once the pie comes out of the oven, cool it for how long? For about an hour. Mm. Now, would your mom have served them on such fancy plates? Well, it depends on who was there. If you were oh. there, yes, probably. Oh, okay. <laughs> Remember Yummy. the time she came to the market and made me iron the napkins because you were coming? <laughs> <laughs> now look how pretty that is. Golden brown on the top. The crust looks so flaky and delicious. Well, it's great to be back in the kitchen with you. It's always fun to bake with and, you, Martha. And thank you so much for coming all the way from North Carolina. My pleasure. And thank all of you for watching. I'll see you on the next episode of Martha Bakes. Flavored whipped cream is a great way to add big flavor with little effort. Here I have pumpkin butter. You just want to gently fold it in so you have that nice marble effect. I love it with pound cake. Another one I like to use is chocolate. See how beautiful that looks with the marbling in it? Raspberry goes well. Just a little dollop of raspberry jam. You could use any flavor jam. Give it a try. I think you'll add a lot of flavor.